Bibles, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Let's preach hard and fast today. How about that? John chapter 20. Got a lot to cover today. The last few weeks we've been talking about after the resurrection of Christ, some appearances he had. As a matter of fact, we talked about the empty tomb. We talked about the empty grave clothes, the unusual appearances. Jesus showing up, he came into a room, walked through a wall to see the disciples. He saw Mary Magdalene in the garden, and she thought he was a gardener. And then last week we talked about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Cleophas and perhaps Luke or whoever. It was written out of the book of Luke, but they came, Jesus popped in behind them as they're walking seven miles from Jerusalem. And they be, described the fact that Jesus had died, been crucified, and uh, some had seen him after his resurrection. And it was Jesus walking with them. And I love this story. And I, I, I remind myself, how many times was Jesus with me and I didn't recognize him? You know, back before I got born again or back when I was running from God, you know, how many times did he just kind of, you know, through, a, through someone or talk through someone? I thought, I just didn't recognize him. And, and then the scripture says that he began to open Genesis uh, through the scriptures to them. And then he broke bread, and they recognized his custom. And a lot of times you can recognize people by the customs of the things they do. You like When you say stuff like, are you comfortable? <laughs> you know, if another preacher comes here and accidentally says that, I can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> you know, because it's our custom, amen, to not be comfortable, but to remind ourselves that, that God is more concerned with our character, amen, and taking care of us. So, uh, and so then he shows up on the road to Emmaus, and he talks to me, and they use this phrase, do not our hearts burn within us? You know, my heart's prayer is that your heart will burn today, that as we share the word of God with you in whatever place you are in life of, of need, amen, that God will meet that. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you about three needs. There are three things in your life you have to have. I, I've I get a lot of invitations, as so do you, on social media. You know how much that pops out over and over. Eric, good to see you over here. I didn't recognize you without your hair. Uh, but the, uh, the, the things with social media, you always get invitations. Invitations to join bike groups or car groups or birthday parties or weddings. You just, it's just, well, and they want to invite you to it, you know, and if you don't hit invite, they wonder if you got the invite, and, and if you hit maybe, they get mad at you if you don't show up, and you know what I'm talking about? It's all over social media, but there are three invitations that Jesus gave over 2,000 years ago. One had to do with are you thirsty, and uh, I promise you this, you will not make it through. You have not even started your day yet. Everybody here that's had a drink today, I, I'm not talking about, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you drunk some water or something, they lift your hand. You see what I mean? You can't start your day without a drink. You got to have a drink. And the water is such a powerful thing in your life. So Jesus deals with that. How about food? How many plan on eating today? Uh, yeah, I know that. I know that about my church. And y'all eat well. Amen. And then rest. That you, if you get an opportunity, you're going to rest. It'll either be tonight or Sunday. I go to Ken. I know Ken's going to rest sometime today. And you know what? He, he's going to rest from drinking and eating. That's what he's going to rest from. Well, these are three essence of life. Without these three, you're not going to live. You're not going to make it. You've got to drink. You've got to eat. And you've got to have rest. And Jesus deals with that through Scripture. And one of them at the very end of his life, I mean, on, on this planet. You know, Jesus hung out here for 40 days after his resurrection. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I love you, man. But I am not hanging out here with you for 40 days after I've already had 60 years. Amen. I'm going to be gone. Wherever God said, I ain't saying dying this year, but whenever I go, amen, I, it, ain't, it ain't about me coming back in, hanging out with you. Jesus hung out, and the Bible uses the word infallible. In other words, uh, you cannot disprove the fact that he was here for 40 days, amen, and hung out. And 40 seemed to be a number for him. You know, 40 days of fasting, and we read 40 all the way through Scripture, 40 years of the Israelites that traveled out of the land of uh, not enough to get to the land of more than enough, amen, as they move from Sinai into the promised land, uh, 40 days, you see 40 days all through Scripture. So it's important to look at this. In John chapter 21, the Scripture says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way, and I believe this is the third time that he's ran across the disciples, once at the grave, once at their house when they were afraid, and now here on the side of the waterway. Simon Peter Thomas called Didymus Nathan from Cana, it ha I like the way it, it happened this way. Nathan, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee. The sons of Zebedee, of course, is James and John. Two other disciples were together. 
Peter said, I'm going out to fish. That's got to be your favorite scripture, David. James, got to be one of your favorite. Going out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter was a fisherman. When Jesus called him in Luke chapter 5, he said, from now on, you're going to catch men. Peter became a fisherman at that moment. But now he has no future. He doesn't see himself in the future. And I want you to hear me. A man or a woman without a future always reverts back to their past. And if you don't have a future to press into, and if you don't see yourself in your tomorrows, you'll always go back to the way you were. You'll go back to your bitterness. You'll go back to your addictions. An addiction is something you'll give everything up for one thing. Recovery is when you give one thing up for everything. Mm -hmm. Amen. So here, here we find that in this place, Peter has gone back to who he once was, which is a fisherman. He gone back into the boat. Now that he's there, the scripture says, and we'll get to it in just a minute, that Jesus uh, intersected his life again, showed back up again. Amen. And, and listen, uh, if you know anything about um, seas, uh, oceans, large by the, the Sea of Galilee, all these great things. To me, timing, Joseph, is so important. To, for Jesus to be at this spot on the shore, to see them right there in the boat. Are you following where I'm going here? So no matter where they went fishing that day, they ended up in this divine appointment. To, I don't know if you think the way I think, but how in the world did Jesus end up right here and there right there? But he did. Father, I thank you for divine appointments. I thank you for futures. I thank you for pressing forward. I thank you for breaking things out of our life and helping us to have a future. In Jesus' name, everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Let's talk about the first invitation of Christ. Amen. In John chapter 7, verse 37, on the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The issue here is when I read this invitation to drink, if you don't know history, if you don't understand what, and this is one of the things I, I thank God for from the college that I was in, the learning that I had, and the fact that I can still explore. And you can do the same thing. You know, you are not handicapped or hindered here. Uh, those watching online or here in the house, amen, to just listen to what I say. You can still study a lot of this out for yourself, amen, which I think is very important. But the last day and the greatest day of the feast, the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, is what it was, seven, the whole week of the Feast of Tabernacles, people were required to move out of their homes and into tents in remembrance of Israel's wandering in the wilderness. The, the, the uh, term traditionally was known as the Hallel. Amen. Now, I know some churches are real big into Jewish history. I remind myself I'm not a Jew. I'm a Gentile. So, you know, I do stuff like muscle car Sunday and things like that that they may not do. But I understand a little bit about history. And so when I look back on this, they went from Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And that's your, that's your homework this week, to read Psalm 113 to 118. And when you read that, that's the Hallel. That's what they would recite. Seven days they moved out of the houses, into their tents, and they reminded themselves of the wanderings of Israel for 40 years that they wandered in the desert before they got to the promised land. So they would quote these scriptures and they would say them. And then the priest would fill buckets of water from the pool of Siloam. And then he would go and he would pour it out daily at the same time at the same place in the temple as the people chanted from Psalm 118, verse 1 and verse 25. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Say it with me. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. One more time. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. Verse 25 says, and again say it with me. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Amen. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Seven days they would do this ritual, they moved out of their houses into their tents. So let me say this to you. Some of you move out of your houses into your RVs. And those are nice. How many know that's nice? But it still doesn't have all the uh, joy of home. Imagine moving out of your home right now into a tent to remind you of once where your people were. It will do this to you. It will put a great appreciation for you. I get invited every now and then to go to, to uh, Dear Lisa's, and, man, I've been to some really nice places. And then I've been to places where I had to build my own bed. <laughs> I've been places with no AC, slapping mosquitoes, amen, and, I mean, uh, snakes all around the place. You know, it's, and, and all of a sudden you have a deep appreciation for your home. 
So these, the Israelites, would move out of their homes, move into tents, and there they would be. And Jesus observed this for seven days. For seven days he would watch them. And remember, the water that they received during that 40 years when they were running out of water was from a rock. And Jesus even made a statement. That rock was him. He was in the Old Testament. In the beginning was the... Word and the Word was God and the Word is God. So he's been, he was with them. He was the cloud that followed them by the day to keep the sunshine off of them. Yesterday I took a bike ride. I had to smother my face in, in that, um, what that stuff? Sunscreen. Amen. To keep from looking like Jimmy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But he was their sunscreen by day. He looked after them all day long to keep them from being burned. And at night, he was the fire that kept them warm at night. That's who Christ was. And so when Jesus, now imagine, the Son of God, God himself, wrapped in flesh, Emmanuel, he's watching the children of Israel for seven days say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. He hears them say that. When they say give thanks to the Lord, who is he? He's Lord. He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's standing there. And then he hears them say, Oh Lord, save us, oh Lord, grant us success. And on that last day, it just he just couldn't help himself. It welled up inside of him and he yelled out, Hey, is anyone thirsty? Let him come and drink. When he said that, he upset the Pharisees and the religious order. And from that day forward, they plotted to kill him. They plotted to take him out because they wanted God to be some transcendental way out under somewhere. They didn't want this personal. And I find this in today. A lot of people don't want a personal relationship. They want their pastor to have it, their priest to have it, some other person to have it, somebody they can talk to, amen, on social media, but they don't want to have it themselves. Listen, Jesus wants to be your Lord and your Savior. Amen. He wants to give you a drink when you're thirsty. He wants to fill you with his presence. Hallelujah. Joel said on that day, I'll pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters, they're going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. I mean, old men are still out there dreaming. Amen. Thank God we can have a dream. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Just never dream you're going to the bathroom. That's what I'll tell you right now in the name of Jesus. All right. Amen. Because that'll get you in a whole lot of trouble. Hallelujah. But here at this moment, thirsty, thirsty. If you're thirsty, come and drink. Hang out with me. And I will tell you that there are times that I thirst for greater things, and I realize that in this life, the greatest essence of thirst that I can fill myself with is Christ. Amen. To enjoy him, to pour it in. And as they shook the palm branches toward the altar, the sacrifices were made. After all this, on the last day, he shouted, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus was declaring himself to be none other than the long-awaited Christ who would pour out his spirit. From this time again, hostility came. So the first thing he said to them, first invitation is come and drink. If you're thirsty, drink from me. Let me say this. A lot of times we drink because there is this desire inside of us to feel something. We feel it with food and with drink. But if you, the more you hang out with him, this is where addictions break. Where you say, great love toward Christ equals strong resistance towards sin. You know, people trying to always say, well, no to this, no to that. No, 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 no. quit that no stuff and start saying yes. Yes to Jesus. And the more you get to love him, the more sin leaves your life. Amen. It's, it's like, I, I don't want to do that because I'm in love with him. The second thing was come and rest. It was an invitation to the weary. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Jesus said, invite. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and will find re you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. To take my yoke was a Jewish phrase for discipline and, and discipleship. You know, you can't be taught if you don't take the yoke. In other words, it's who you're connected with. And Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. And if you know anything, and I know most of you are a country, Country folk know this, that a yoke has a spot for two animals. Amen. And there are times that, uh, that you feel like you're weak, but if he has the yoke, he's doing all the work. Amen. He's doing all the pulling. You just along with him and staying connected with him. And he says if you need rest, rest, rest can be found, by the way, you don't have to sleep to get rest. Sometimes I, I, can, I can rest by just being still. Amen. Just praying. I came in here Tuesday night and prayed with a two or more group. Loved this bunch. Amen. It's, it's a powerful moment for me. But just rest. Uh, I'm on my bike or car, whatever. I can rest. Now, it may be a nap at times, but I can rest in him. Resting in him is security. It's knowing that no matter what happens, 
I told my pastor today, if you ride a, a motorcycle like we do, you can't be afraid of death. Amen. And you sure can't be afraid to live. Because there's, there's issues here in my life that I realize that if I have that kind of fear, I can't, I can't press in and do these things I do. And I realize I rest in him knowing that if something happened to me, amen, he's got me and he's got them. Take my yoke. Find rest for your soul. Let me remind you this about your soul. Your soul is your mind, your intellect, your thinking. What good will it do a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Not spirit, your soul. In other words, a lot of stuff will make you go mad. When I didn't have a lot, I wasn't concerned about a lot. But the more stuff you get, the more stuff you try to hang on to, and then you got to realize who am I going to leave it to? Or who going to fight over this? I'm just being honest with you right now. Amen. Then your mind starts going crazy. Hallelujah. You hear what I'm saying? So be careful that you're able to handle mentally all the stuff you are getting physically. Hallelujah. Mm, good preaching, Pastor. Thank you. All right. That's good. I mean, I'm, I've been doing this long enough. I can even man myself. So with the yoke comes strength. Your yoke is supported by his yoke. Now comes the dining part. So he, he tells us if I need rest, I come to him. Amen. If I need to drink, I can come to him. John 21, afterward, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. It was Peter, Nathaniel, son Zebedee, J&J. &J. Uh, two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Peter said. They said, well, we'll go with you. Do you know a lot of times when you want to go somewhere, you want to go back to the way you, where you were, whatever it was you were into, there's always somebody who wants to go back there with you. Amen. They followed him on back. I'm going out to fish. Well, we'll go with you. Amen. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now, I'm not a fisherman. If you promise me we will catch something, I'll go. But I'm not a fisherman, per se. All night long, all night, from, from the time the sun went down to the time the sun went up, they caught nothing. You're talking about depressing. You talk about downtrodden. You talk about, and listen, here's what, another thing I've learned through life. When you're not fishing, you're fighting. you fussing. you mad. You know, you upset. Hallelujah. You start turning on one another when you're not fishing. Hallelujah. You're upset because well, I thought you said this bait would hit. I thought you said this was a good spot. Amen. You start getting mad at who brought you out in the boat. You're just upset, man. You just get fighting. And the same way goes on in the church world. When you're not fishing for people, when you're not reaching out toward people, the churches start turning on one another, start fighting one another. Amen. You got to start casting your net. Can I get an amen? So early in the morning, Jesus Stood on the shore. But the disciples, here it is, they didn't recognize it. They didn't realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. What did he say? Throw your net on the right side of the boat. And you'll find. What did he say? He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, Peter, and we'll find some. Oh, I remember those instructions. That if I use a rooster tail here, I might catch some. So they throw that net on the right side of the boat, and then it started happening. Fish started jumping into the net, popping in. 20, 40, 60, 100, 120. 140, 150, 151, 152, 153 fish, 153 fish jumped up in the net. Amen. At that moment, when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. When the disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, I wonder who he was. John, y'all should know that by now. When the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Hey, it's the Lord. Amen. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off. How I many know he was getting comfortable? And he jumped into the water. Now, I can't prove this. You can't disprove it. But I think at this moment, Peter heard the words, It's the Lord. And he thought to himself, I'm just going to walk on the water right on out to him. Why else put your clothes back on? Huh? 
If you're going swimming, you remove the garments and you get out in the water. Instead, Peter puts his water, his clothes off, jumps out in the water. Now he's got found himself swimming. I ain't walking on the water. I got to swim. Sometimes I walk, sometimes I swim. I don't care what you do, get to it. Amen. So the other disciple followed in the boat. Hallelujah. Towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore. About 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with, with fish on it. Some bread. Which means that while you out there catching nothing, Jesus was catching. Uh-huh. Yeah, he catching. He didn't go to Long John Silver's. He was catching. Amen. He already caught fish. Can you imagine fishing with Jesus? You're talking about cheating. <laughs> he know where they at. He know what side to throw the net. Jesus walk out in the water, put a net down, fish just jump in. And, I mean, they're just ready to go fish. I mean, it's just cheating going with Jesus. Some of y'all pray before you go fishing. Shame on you. He, man, so he goes, he takes a fish. He got the fire burning. He got the coals on it, man. And then when, when they landed, they saw a fire burning coals, fish on it, some bread. And where did he get the bread? I, I just love this. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. How many? 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Thank you, Lord. Which tells me it doesn't matter how many God keeps putting in this house, it's going to be big enough. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Time for breakfast, boys. You've been out all night. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. It literally means that he blessed it and gave them some of the fish. This was now... The third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. I've often called this uh, go fish, no fish, oh fish. Amen. Because they went, went, went fishing. I'm going fishing is what Peter said. They went following. That's go fish. Amen. And then, no, hey guys, you got any fish? No. I've often said never ask a fisherman if he caught something because he will always tell you. And now you'll see it on Facebook. And Instagram, they're going to make sure you know they call, no matter how little that fish was. Amen. How big was they going? They got to post that thing, man. Hey, guys, you got any fish? No, we ain't got none. Go fish, no fish. And then the revelation. Oh, fish. Fishing without Jesus is futile. Witnessing without Jesus is futile. Not having Christ in your heart is futile. Amen. You got to have that. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Do you have the memory of the day that Jesus touched your life, turned some things around, gave you miracles? You got to go back and remember that. When he said to them, cast your net on the right side, he's talking out of Luke chapter 5 when he first met them and they hadn't caught anything. He told Peter, cast your net on the right side. The, net, the, the boat started tipping over. It's Peter and Jesus in the boat. You remember the story? Amen. It's tipping over to the side and, and Peter calls for help. Peter and James and John jump in that little boat and run out there in that little Evan route. Amen. And help them haul that fish to that's Luke chapter 5. Now we hit it here at the end of the story. Jesus still the same. Jesus casting it on the right side. Amen. And when they did, they hauled this, uh, this, the fish to shore. And Jesus asked a very powerful question. Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these 153 fish? Let me mention this to you too. Some people say you shouldn't count people, Pastor. Jesus counted the fish. He knew there's 153. Everyone counts. Everyone matters. But do you love me more than these fish? And I think the fish dealt with his past. It dealt with his occupation. You know, when I think of people, I think, what are our fish that we love more than him? Hmm. Hammerhead sharks, hammerhead, work. Love, you will love work more than Jesus. Catfish, your pets, your hobbies. There's even a thing on the internet now called catfishing. Amen. Do you love me more than these? Piranha, habits that eat you up. How about blowfish? You love me more than blowfish? That's musicians. Uh -huh. Electric eel, a hot relationship that's not even a fish. I said eel, not fish. Hardhead fish, stubbornness or attitude, sheephead fish, love ministry more than the Messiah, 
Man, that's a temptation. In Peter's case, I believe Jesus was speaking of Peter's former way of life. Listen, it is painful for men to be interrogated about love. Ladies, I don't know a lot about y'all, but I can tell you something about men. Men hate to be interrogated about love. Do you love? Don't, don't you love me? I told you when I married you. Well, they won't hear it all the time. I mean, that's what they know. But men struggle with this. We, we, struggle, we struggle. Men struggle saying to one another, don't you love Jesus? We struggle with that kind of interrogation. And Jesus catches Peter here, and he begins to interrogate him. And he said, do you love me more than these? Do you remember how many times Peter denied Jesus? Prophetically, Jesus said, you'll deny me three times. Amen. And he did before the rooster crowed. Now Jesus is turning it around, and he's going to give him three opportunities to love him back. So he says to him again, amen, do you love me? Do you love me? Amen, follow me. The third time, the third time, he said to him in verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Amen, three times he pressed him, he pressed him, he pressed, do you love me more than these? The, the fishing, all the stuff you're doing, the boat, the things that you're in, do you love? Because I'm going to tell you something to you, Peter. Life is not what you think. Come on up here, Joseph. If you were, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? I done said it twice to you. And he said to him, Lord, you know, all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Amen. But Peter answered Jesus in honesty and humility. Amen. He said, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, Peter, you dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God when he said to him, follow me. There's something incredibly tough and kind about the command. You're going to die. Well, that's not something we look at one another and say, hey, oh, by the way, you know you're going to die. We don't say that to one another. But death did not have, when Jesus went to hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, he broke the jaw. You know, there are certain dogs, if they bite, they will lock their jaw. And it's almost impossible. You have to put a stick, a bar or something in it and snap their jaw to break the grip. Well, death had a, a bite on people. And his jaw had been locked and clamped. And people were fearful of death. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He raised the widow of Nain from the grave. He raised Jairus' daughter from the grave. He, 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 and then he rose himself from the grave. What did he do? He snapped the jaw of death to where it just flops. And it doesn't have the same power it used to. So he looks at Peter and he said, Peter, listen. One day you're going to die. But it's not going to be when you're young. It will be when you get older. But until then, follow me. Stick with me, son. Do you know you're reading the book of Acts where Peter was put in jail, incarcerated? And the scripture says that the next day, the next day they're going to execute him. They're going to take his life. And we find him in the book of Acts asleep. If you are in jail and you know the next day you're going to be executed, will you sleep? Well, I don't know. Peter had a promise. Everybody say promise. There are promises I hold on to in the Word of God. Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household will be saved. I hold on to that promise. Amen. For my family. No matter what I see physically, by faith I hold on to it. Amen. There are promises I read out of Psalm 103 and Psalm 107 about healing. I hang on to them. Believe God for them. Amen. So here's Peter. Jesus looks at him. He says, look, when you're old, they're going to lead you. So he's in jail, sleeping. The angel comes in, wakes Peter up. An angel. Peter get up, takes him out. I don't know what it was about Pete and his clothes. But he's on his way out, and the angel makes him go back and get his clothes on. He was evidently a real confident disciple. I don't know. There's something about him. He just, so he made him go back in and get his clothes on. And then they come out. And as they move out, outside, Peter goes out and starts preaching. We find that in tradition, history tells us Peter died upside down on a cross as he got old. They led him where he didn't want to go. Jesus told him that. He, Jesus also told him that Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. That your faith wouldn't fail. So the most powerful thing you got is your faith. 
Jesus invites us to come and drink. He invites us to rest. He invites us to eat. He said, the disciples said to him one time, they said, Lord, aren't you hungry? He said, I have bread you know not of. I have bread you know not of. When I eat of this, it satisfies. If I eat something else, I'm going to have to eat again. This right here is satisfaction. Amen. Jesus wanted Peter's heart without a single reservation. Everybody heard the single out command to Peter. James and John was there. Nathaniel was there. Two other disciples were there. John! John was there! And Jesus singles out Peter. And I think in life, if you're honest, he singles you out. And when he does, do you know what the human response is? What about John? What about Joseph? What about Birdman? Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was he? Was following them. I think he's just nosy. He just following them. Jesus was the one who had leaned back. This was when he leaned back against uh, Jesus at the supper and he said, Lord, Who's going to betray you? He was always questioning. Amen. He's always questioning. So when Peter saw him, he asked the Lord, what about him? What about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You follow me. You follow me. I get like Peter. I say, Lord, I've been through this. I've been doing this for 40 years now. Pastoring for 28 years. Preaching for 40. And I, I get that way. And I say, now hold on a minute, Lord. Listen, I've been doing this this long. And this young puppy comes along and starts preaching. And now he's on the internet. And he's got 150,000 followers. And he's stealing my sermons. I got 500 folk coming to church on Sunday. He got 150,000 followers. <laughs> you know what Jesus said? He looked at me just like he did Peter. Well, you know, when I said, what about him? He said, My, here, here's another invitation. I'll give you one last invitation. Mind your own business. <laughs> Amen. Mind your own business. What is it to you? If I want John to remain alive, if I want that young man to have 150,000 followers, and you if it, with 500, two churches, what's it to you? Amen. You do you. You do you. Amen. Follow me. Know this. You will die. But follow me. Because that's just a transition. God saves us individually. He commissions us. You know, sometimes I have to back off and say, that's none of my business. That's none of my business. Amen. Amen. He commissions us individually. He gifts us individually. He didn't give everybody the same gift. He speaks in directly to us individually. For a moment, Peter forgot that and became overly concerned and interested in the will of God for John's life. I mean, you know, he, it was, he wasn't concerned about the will of God. What if Jesus would have said, okay, Peter, let me just tell you what's going to happen. You're going to die upside down on the cross. But my boy John here, he's going to die of old age. What are you saying? I'm going to die. He can die old age. I got to die on the cross. Oh, I forgot to mention to you. They're going to pour boiling oil on top of John. And then they're going to isolate him and quarantine him on an island called Patmos. Is that the life you want, Peter? Oh, well, never mind, Lord. I'll take quick death any day. You see what I'm saying? You don't always understand people's lives, what they got going on until you walk in their shoes. You don't know what they're dealing with. Each of us plays a unique role. Quit looking. God in heaven. Quit looking for equality. Quit looking to make everything equal. I, I'm so fed up with what I am hearing. Abraham Lincoln started that. Everybody was born equal. Nobody was born equal. Most of you didn't have an outhouse like I did. Most of you didn't pick cotton like I did. But I wasn't raised an orphan either. Everybody has individual lives. We're not born equal. If all men are equal and all men are brothers, then why are the rich more equal than others? Some folk are born with silver spoons. 
and they forget about it. Others had to work their way up. Equality. There is no equality. I don't care what, what your ethnos is. There's only one race. It's human. And then there's a whole bunch of ethnos, ethnicities. Amen. We all got different. If I ask you, where you, I'm German this, I'm Irish that, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Native American this, I'm, I'm a Heinz 57. I'm, Daddy never told me where he'd been. <laughs> Hello. There's no equality. So when he looks over there, John, and said, what about John? Should we have the equal? Here we both disciples. Amen. He, he got in trouble too. He went fishing when he wasn't supposed to go fishing. We both in on it. We both sin. What about James? James loses his head in the next few months. He'll be the first one disciple. The, uh, dispatched. Somebody asked me once, Pastor, what, what do you really do? Well, I'm hatch, match, patch, and dispatch. Hatch when they're born. Match them, keep them, marry them, patch them if I try to keep them that way. and Dispatch them, kick them off to heaven. That's pretty much the level of what I get to do. I miss your mom and daddy. Pam, they were wonderful. We're looking for equality. Some go through great difficulties in this life, while others seemingly are hardly touched. Phew. It's so easy when times are tough to lash out and bitterly lobby for an equal wrongs amendment. Mm, preacher preaching good today. Preacher gearing up for the end of the month. Yeah. Let me just say this to you. On the 30th of May, we will, in this church and out at the other campus, of course, the other campus is where we have the room for a lot of stuff to do as far as, we're going to have a biker Sunday. And I want to honor on Memorial Day weekend our veterans, the fallen, those who have served in the military. I want to honor First responders, police, I want to honor firemen, EMS. I want to bring a little patriotism back to the little country church in this area to remind ourselves that had it not been for these great men and women who fought for our freedom to stand up and speak, the knotheads I'm hearing, the snowflakes I'm listening to, hey amen, all that nonsense, hey amen, they had their right to get to say that because of what our men and women done. But for you to shut up and act like the word patriot is a bad word, man, I think of Israel, David, amen, and that the God of America to me is the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I don't want to, I'm not backing off on that. So last week I thought, man, you know what, we've done muscle car Sunday, why don't we do a biker Sunday? Because the most patriotic people I know are bikers. They will fight you over that flag. They will run over you. And some of them love Jesus. <laughs> so we're going to have, we'll, we'll talk more about this as we move along. But it'll be on Memorial Day weekend. Amen. I want to make it the most patriotic service you have ever been to. Hallelujah. So we're going we're to have church here, but we're also going to do it out there. And then afterward, we're going to feed everybody the, the Memorial Day dinner. Hot dogs. <laughs> It's going to be different than Muscle Car Sunday. They're not going to be tractors and trailers. It's going, to be a, it's going to be an exciting service, but a somber service. It's going to be one of those that's going to help remind us of why we've got the liberties we've got today. Amen. For the one who died for us and the ones who've died for us. Hallelujah. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I've got to pray for you before we leave. To our guests in the house, thank you for coming today. Man, you, we so appreciate people visiting here and coming back to this house, those watching online. But there's a word, an invitation from Jesus to come and drink. Come and drink from me. Amen. Get to know me. Thirst for me. Let me say this to you, church, that if your head is thirsty, your heart is thirsty, your spirit is thirsty, God will fill you 
wherever your thirst is. It doesn't have to be in this house. It can be anywhere. You just got to stay thirsty for him. God, fill me with your presence. You are hungry for the word. Amen. And when he says to come and dine, amen, come and eat, eat from the word. The word is the bread of life. When I eat of it, I gain strength. In rest, I, I remind myself I cannot do this on my own. I can't run this business on my own. I can't run this family on my own. I can't run life on my own. I can't get up on my own. Lord, let me yoke myself to you and stay connected to you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. We got to get back into a rhythm. If I get our servant leaders to come up and help me out, those who are helping with our, our buckets, say, we're going to pass the buckets, guys. All right. In front of you is an envelope. Amen. Let's raise our level of giving and believing here in this house. Amen. If you are not a tither, uh, I encourage you to step into this principle of 10%. Amen. It has never changed for 5,000 years. Amen. God has kept it at this place. Amen. Your government will change. I ate at a place yesterday with a bunch of guys called Trump Burgers in Belleville, Texas. I'm serious. It said Trump on Trump Burgers. You heard of that? Any of y'all ever heard of that place? Great hamburgers. Amen. And uh, affordable. And I thought to myself, <laughs> and I don't mean this mean, but yeah, I guess I do. So, I don't think you're ever going to see a Biden burger anywhere. <laughs> but this place was, this place, man, I'm telling you, it was just out in the middle of Belleville. And that's what we thought. Well, let's go eat a burger, man. So we went there. And, and uh, then I reminded myself, that, that, as a matter of fact, long before I went there, I'd already dealt with the, most, with the uh, biker Sunday. And I will say this. I thank God that President Trump had a patriotism about him. Because I'm tired of seeing the officials we got now not saluting back to our sailors and our soldiers and those. And, and losing, you start losing that, all you need is one generation to lose that. Amen. And then we'll forget it forever. That's why we've got to keep this alive. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So as the buckets are being passed, I'll say this, and then David will come up and make the rest of the announcements. As we give today, we're believing God for? More money. Benefits. Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and dis <laughs> favor and success to the king. Hey, if you watch it online, you need to be given online. If you watch it online, you need to be given online. Amen. Go to holywild.net slash give. Amen. Don't leave this house yet now. Amen. Even though that bucket's gone by, you've got to get an announcement and a closing prayer. Eddie B is